Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Belinda Goldsmith. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Thomson Reuters Foundation, where I run a team of 45 staff journalists and 150 freelancers covering the underreported stories. And Africa, Africa falls very much into that. I'm delighted today to introduce as the panelists Yono Frederick Aga, Deputy Director General of the WTO, who was appointed Nigeria's ambassador to the WTO in 2005. Um, back home in Benue State, he's championed rural electrification projects as well as many other community projects to help the less privileged. Then we have Grant Harris, CEO of Harris Africa Partners, that advises companies and organizations on strategy, policy, and migrating risk with respect to doing business in Africa. For four years, Grant served as the principal advisor to President Barack Obama on issues related to Africa. In this role, initiating and coordinating US policies towards the 49 countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Grant also serves as non-executive independent director on the board of the Africa Finance Corporation that's invested more than four billion US dollars in infrastructure projects across Africa. And then we have Mariam Jam from I Am The Code. Mariam is often called the diplomat of technology. Uh, her consulting company, Spot One Global Solutions, helps tech companies to get a foothold in Africa, Europe, the Middle East, and Asia. She also set up I Am The Code, which is an Africa-led movement to set, get government, business, and investors to support young women in um, science, technology, engineering, arts, mathematics, and design by learning how to code. So the panel today comes at a very topical time. We've seen Donald Trump uh, rolling back on some investments overseas. We've seen in China the rapid growth, which has led to China to relocate some of its manufacturing offshores, including to Africa. But what does all this mean for Africa? In recent years, African land has become very appealing and vulnerable to acquisition with a scramble for natural resources on the continent. What changes will that bring and what are the risks? So straight on to the panelists and the first question I'd like to ask each of you is why invest in Africa? Grant, can I start with you? Why invest in Africa? Absolutely. There are a lot of reasons to do so as you're thinking demographically about the continent. It's a young population, increasingly urbanized, increasingly connected. The number of mobile broadband subscriptions is going to double to a billion in the next five years. McKinsey and others are talking about the long-term fundamentals, and so there's really a lot of opportunity. The problem is that many investors are misperceiving or misconceiving of the amount of risk, and that's something that we need to talk about and fix. Thank you. You know, why invest in Africa? Well, I think uh, from my perspective, why people focus on the challenges of investing in Africa, I think these challenges actually should be seen as opportunities, whether it's infrastructure, in power, transportation, these are all opportunities. And the integration of Africa, which creates better returns than any other region in the world, I think are enough reasons for any good investor to put uh, his capital in Africa for better returns. Thank you. Miriam? I think we, we need to invest in Africa uh, because it's the next frontier uh, right now. Africa is a new, uh, is growing, the continent is growing fast, uh, Chinese, Chinese are investing, uh, and especially if we're talking about Europe, there's no choice. Uh, we're leaving Brexit, we know we're leaving the EU, and so Africa will be the next uh, place to, to invest. We have amazing opportunities in the continent. But also we have the youth, uh, especially women and girls who are growing up across the country right now. So if, if people don't invest in Africa, it will be at their peril, definitely, for the next 10 years. Miriam, you mentioned, of course, in UNE the next frontier, investment from China. What other trends are we seeing in investment in Africa? Grant. I think the trends vary based on the sector, but you mentioned China. You mentioned th there's great interest, not just by China, but by Brazil, by Turkey. The EU has been trying to pen trade agreements across the continent. There's been increased activity over previous years. 
the U.S. has tried to step up its game but has more to do. I think in the trends there is a greater realization as you're thinking about the connectivity of the population, the penetration of cell phone access and how that has really revolutionized uh, mobile banking. Mobile banking then has knock-on effects in terms of access to insurance, credit ratings and the like. So you see these trends across different industries that investors who are savvy, as I think fellow panelists have mentioned, are really eyeing that and seeing Africa as the last frontier as a place where you can really get returns. You've got to navigate the local markets. It's obviously not one market. It's not one country. It's diverse and dynamic. But you've got to be in the market and actually investing to see those returns. You know, what trends are you seeing now in Africa? Well, uh, I have seen a situation whereby most of African countries having undergone reforms are no longer looking at just the traditional partners in terms of the previous colonial relations. I'm seeing a situation whereby many African countries are interested in South-South cooperation, which is a dimension that we have not seen before. So when you talk of China, you talk of India, you talk of Brazil, these are creating better inroads into Africa. And I think this uh, creates better synergies around the emerging economies and an Africa that is rising. So I think that adds up more value to the global economy than the previous uh, trends that we had seen. Mary, you mentioned the youth there's an opportunity there. What trends are you seeing in the youth in Africa? I mean, if you just look into it right now, for example, uh, just look at a couple of countries in, in Africa, Rwanda and Senegal, my country. And the trends are uh, guys are working on AI. They watch, they're working on, on robotics. They watch, they watch, uh, they're working on data. Uh, they're really working on the current trends you see in Europe. And we have 317 tech hubs across Africa where people are building businesses. Young women are creating their e-commerce sites really massive opportunities in the continent. And I think we need to kind of like change the narrative from, uh, you know, what do we want to see as a, as a global uh, community, as a global society? We can't leave Africa behind anymore because Africans are leapfrogging, they're going anywhere. And so, uh, and I think we need to start thinking about, okay, why do we want to invest in Africa? Because it's just a business case. We need to just go in the continent, take all the risks. Uh, you know, Africa will not be perfect. We can't wait for Africa to be perfect for people to start investing in that. And I think we need partners, we need collaboration, we need people to take the risk with us uh, across the continent. And if you look at my, the, the youth I work with across the continent, and they're all looking investment, they're building the most amazing tech solutions you've ever seen. Um, I mean, from uh, Nairobi uh, to slums in Kibera, they're really building amazing solutions. And I, I can't see those solution here uh, in, in, in Portugal. So I think we just need to think about you know, what, is the, what do we want to do as a global community? Do you want to leave Africa behind? Or do you want to actually go and partner with Africans? And if you look in the next 10 years, especially on the Sustainable Development Goals, which I'm uh, heavily involved right now in the next 15 years for the United Nations agenda. You know, we have uh, amazing data in the continent. Uh, you know, people are going and now setting up organizations to look into what's happening in the continent, especially for consumer good. Africa is a continent where you need to go and look into the AI. If you really want to find a, a diverse AI, a, you know, a variable of AI, it's the continent you need to go into. So I think we just need to look into the current trends as uh, is, is happening in Europe and then go and tap into the continent and collaborate with Africans and then see, let's work together and have more empathy, I think, and compassion and, and just like, you know, more uh, leave our biases behind and just engage with Africans. You mentioned, of course, making a business case and there are risks involved. What are the major challenges and how do you make a business case to investors to get over those challenges? Grant? I'd like to address that, but first I want to pick up on a really important word used, which is narrative. And that's a problem when there's discussion about Africa because the narrative tends to be monolithic. In 2000, The Economist had this cover, Africa is hopeless. 15 years later, you fast forward, it's Africa rising. And the problem is that that doesn't capture the diversity. It doesn't capture the many different markets. It doesn't capture the, the hotbeds of entrepreneurialism, but it also doesn't capture some of the places where there's still conflict and problems. It's, you can't be painted with one brush. And so in talking about the challenges, and we've used the word frontier markets as well, there are challenges to doing business in Africa, clearly, but the problem with the narrative is that somehow people tend to talk about Africa as if those challenges are unique to Africa, as if corruption or challenges with governance 
or these problems that need to be navigated in frontier markets are somehow unique to Africa, it, when they're not. They're not. And I think that that's where the misconceptions come in. So there are infrastructure challenges that can be seen as opportunities, as, a, as my fellow panelist has noted. There are governance challenges in many places. There's a problem with consistency with policy priorities, and, and there's a need for reform. But there are also many African states that are taking the bull by the horns and trying to improve the investment climate. Just this last week, the World Bank issued its latest round of the ease of doing business rankings, and over a third of the top performers were African states that were really seeking concrete reforms to make it easier to invest and do business. You know, what challenges do you think there are, and how are they being addressed? As Grant mentioned, a couple there. Well, I think one of the critical challenges in Africa has been the fragmentation and segmentation of the market. And I believe the ongoing initiative by the African Union Commission to put in place a continental free trade area will be very, very vital in addressing regional integration and enabling Africa to trade amongst itself and with the rest of the world. There is also some level of implementation of the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement, which has greatly reduced not just trade costs, but also the transaction costs and eliminated a lot of the uncertainty with respect to policies because documents are being harmonized, transparency is being entrenched in customs and the regret border agency regulations. So I think all these taken together, and if you look at even uh, the right of establishment in Africa now, you have in the banking sector, you have banks moving across, so payments are no longer being such a big problem for businesses. And I think taken together, all this produce a better enabling environment for the private sector in Africa. Could you give a few more details on free trade Africa, the timeline for that and where it is at the moment? Well, the free trade is, uh, is in line with the global, or the, what you call the African, uh, the Africa we want, Agenda 2063 where you are thinking of all the African countries coming together. So the process is ongoing, uh, starting with different areas of uh, integration, standards, both sanitary st and phytosanitary standards, technical barriers to trade. They are also looking at harmonizing their tariff regimes, including an intra-African uh, preferential trade framework, which can now enable any business setup in any African country to benefit from the both markets. So the idea is to have one single market for goods and services, right of establishment. For instance, if you look at in West Africa, they already have a common passport, which enables you to go in and out of any country without a visa. So all these are being taken up, and I can assure you this has the highest commitment of the political authorities, both being reviewed by the heads of states and heads of governments and by ministers every six months. It's expected that the continental free trade area, depending on how the negotiations evolve on the remaining areas, could come into effect early next year, if not by the end of this year, when the agreement is finalized. Thank you. Mary, what, what do you see as the challenges and risks, and how do you think the Free Trade Africa Agreement will help? I mean, uh, the, the challenge I see personally, it's, uh, and, and, and the people I deal with, is the narratives. And really people understanding the continent. And I think that's the why the work we do is quite crucial to go and, and tell people what's happening in the continent. And, and there are so many success stories, especially at the marginalized communities level, all the way to women and girls building their companies. Uh, you know, so many industries in the continent. I mean, you know, the Obama administration uh, did an amazing work in, in creating this YALI network where you have this amazing African entrepreneur building solutions. And I think we have a, a challenge as a continent to tell the world what we do and also to showcase exactly the, uh, you know, the case, the case, the case studies. That's, that's a big challenge. 
challenge. And also our government marketing our continent in a very positive way. And then we are the only people that can do this as a continent. And I think if we can start really showing, uh, you know, coming here at the Web Summit, for example, showing, you know, the amazing innovation we have in the continent and how the internet is changing people's life, how the girls are, are coding. Uh, you know, I, I live in the southeast of England, which is a very wide dominant uh, place. Uh, you know, where we have young girls who can't even code. And I go to, I just came back from Madagascar this morning uh, in Kampala where a young girl can code four languages, from Python to Ruby, like really four languages. And so, and, and this, this narrative, they, they, you can't hear this in Europe because they said, oh, Africa is very poor, and it's not true. And so we need to really start thinking about as a global community, especially as a tech community, uh, what do we want to hear from Africa? Who do we want to hear from? And I think the more, we, the more we start listening to Africans, but also allowing the narrative to be positive. And now, you know, it's the, African prob the problem is not just African anymore. It's a global problem. What happened in Africa will affect people in the West. And what happened in, uh, you know, in the West will, ha will affect people in Africa. So I think the more we bring this empathy, this compassion, and listen to what's happening in the continent, I think we'll realize that actually, you know what, it's not bad to go to Africa. I mean, we're bringing, in about in a couple of days, we're bringing one of the biggest uh, you know, uh, hospitality management website in, in the world going to Africa to recruit my girls. And these people, they will not come to Africa if Africa was not a business case. Mark Zuckerberg wouldn't travel all the way from uh, Mountain View to go to Nigeria just for fun. You know, uh, Jack Ma wouldn't invest $10 million in Kenya if Africa was not a, a, the next frontier, if it's not fancy for them. So I think that as, as CEOs, as tech companies, as the traders, uh, you know, as, as, bi as business people, we need to start seeing Africa as the next frontier of investment, as Kagame said, uh, in 2012, and really engage with people like us. We are the practitioners on the ground. We can We have a massive database of the top African coders in the continent. And the more we do this as a society, the more we will build business case and generate profit. Uh, otherwise, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. You mentioned how many tech startup hubs are there now in Africa? Uh, 317. 317. Uh, what other sectors are you seeing that are doing particularly well on attracting investment? Grant, from a US perspective, what other areas are particularly people interested in? There's a lot of interest in energy right now, particularly because there's so many opportunities and such a great need. Though a lot of those deals are taking too long. Yep. They're taking literally years longer than in some other regions and that does dissuade investment. But I also see a lot of interest in agriculture and Africa is home to over 60% of the world's arable land that's not being cultivated right now. There's immense opportunity there when increasing productivity. Uh, but then in, when it comes to information technology, when it comes to mobile banking, th there are a lot of different sectors that are vibrant and exciting. I think one of the issues that we've been touching at here in terms of this narrative, it's not just about Africans being able to better tell a story, it's also about in the West being able to think differently and be much more nuanced. I really don't understand still why when people think about Africa, they're thinking civil war in South Sudan or they're thinking Ebola. And that's because that's what tends to be covered in the news. Yep. And we, as particularly in the United States, we don't learn about Africa as much growing up in our school system. And so uh, the misconceptions and stereotypes are so prevalent. Yep. So we've got this big disconnect. As Ernst & Young is surveying investors each year, they find that those investors who are on the continent are much more bullish and much more positive about Africa's economic outlook than those who are not. And so we see this broad chasm between those who get it, those who are there doing deals, pursuing opportunities, they see the dynamism, they, they see this side of the story, but then, then there's this broad swath of people that are late to the game. And that's what worries me because it's so critical and it's not just the last frontier and it's not just that Africa needs the capital, but it's really to the detriment of US and other companies to not be seizing these opportunities. Can I pick you up there and ask people on the panel, what are the risks? If there's not more investment in Africa, what are the risks of that? Yonov. Well, I, I think uh, we need to appreciate two things. Africa needs to be helped. Af not just helped, it is also important to recognize and reward the ongoing reforms that are taking place in Africa. And coming from the WTO, the key challenge is not just the current anti-globalization and protectionist sentiments, but also the need to recognize that in spite of all these, African countries are still undertaking significant domestic 
reforms. So the idea is if you want a better world, you need to reward the reforms that are taking place in Africa with better markets. Otherwise, you end up with some backsliding. And I believe growth in Africa is good for the, the, the whole economy because Africa still remains a key market for many of the world's uh, 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 businesses, as we are saying. So I think, uh, for me, we shouldn't be looking at just the risks and risks. We should also be looking at the opportunities. We should also be looking at Africa rising up and being a major player and contributing, not just in terms of those days when everybody wants to give, give. Africa now wants to also be a player and contribute to global development. So multilateral cooperation should remain important. We need to strengthen WTO rules that will ensure that as Africa reforms, is exposed to a level playing field. So some of the issues like agricultural subsidies in the WTO, fisheries subsidies in the WTO, the ongoing conversations among members on uh, e -com electronic commerce, how to help uh, small and medium-sized enterprises better integrate into the global economy. I think these conversations will help reduce whatever challenges anybody we see coming out of Africa. Okay. Marianne, the risks? I mean, I do totally agree. Um, there, is, there are risks everywhere you go. There are risks. But I think that, um, like my colleague just said earlier, is that we need to start thinking about, you know, what do we want to, as I said earlier, what do you want to see and how do we change this? And Africa is not looking to be validated, by the way, because, you know, you have an amazing African president understanding the domestic issues in their continent. But I think we need to start thinking about if we don't invest in Africa, if we don't do anything across the continent and collaborate with Africans, what will happen in the West? I mean, like I said earlier, we have, Africans are not even coming to Europe anymore. They're staying in their continent. I mean, Paul, Paul Kagame have, like, get the best Africans in his government. Mozambique, they're all sitting on board. I mean, I sit on 19 African government as an advisor. And so they're looking at this African capacity, the Africans who, you know, who are highly qualified, uh, ex, you know, expert in their fields, and now we, we are actually building our continent. And so when you come to Africa, not only you are dealing with government, but you're also dealing with people like us, who cares about uh, transparency, we care about good governance, we care about developing the skills of our people, but also we would like to involve women and girls into our programs. And so, again, you know, he's just taking a leap and coming and having a faith and said, okay, well, I'm going to go and try what's happening in Mozambique. I see many Portuguese people in Mozambique right now investing there. And so look into the continent as a holistic uh, 54 countries, not just what you see in Sudan or what you see on BBC, but see the continent as like five regions, uh, extremely dynamic. Uh, in, a, in the next 10, 20 years, 34% of the African continent will be middle class. Uh, Nigerian women millionaires are spending their money on Amazon and on Booking.com. Uh, you, know, you have really amazing women uh, investing into agriculture, business solution being built. And so once you open your mind into the, uh, you know, who's going to buy my solution? Uh, who's going to, you know, sometimes you can actually have African women, uh, you know, buying your Chloe bags. Uh, you know, we now care about sustainability. Women care about uh, amazing, beautiful stuff, jewelries and, and bags and iPads. And so if you start thinking about, you know, the continent as a, a consumer uh, continent, people will buy my solution. And then, you know, if you really are a CEO, you need to make some profit. So where are you going to go? Africa. They have visa cards. Like my friend said, they got mobile money. African women, Nigerian millionaire, are sitting down with visa cards right now. And they can buy $1,000 per day, $2,000 on a consumer good. And so that's money for you being lost. And so if, when you start thinking about uh, Africa as an equal, uh, rather than kind of like top down, it's a poor country, it's a poor continent, it's no good, I'm not going to go there, I'm going to get malaria or whatever. And then, you know, you're missing a, a business case. So my appeal is that, uh, you know, have more empathy and compassion and kindness. Look into the continent as people like us. We're equal, we're educated, we're very influent in, uh, we have a massive influence in the continent. And we are putting government, we're holding government accountable uh, in their work and we're sitting on the board. So uh, come and deal with us and uh, you're going to make profit. Holding governments accountable. What's the international role in that? That's a key thing you mentioned. What's an international role in holding governments accountable in Africa? May I speak to the risks before yeah. we go yeah. on? Yeah, sure. I agree completely, but I think what you're hearing is there's a self-interested economic case to investing. 
And over the next decade, there'll be at least $400 billion increase in consumption growth in Africa. There's a clear case. But the question about risks, there's also a really important danger if there isn't the level of development and economic growth that we need to see. It's a very young population. The median age is just over 19 years. M the majority of the population is under the age of 35, and each year more and more uh, of these uh, young leaders are looking for jobs. And African leaders are not able currently to create them in the numbers that are needed. I don't mean to spew statistics, and my wife accuses me of doing that all the time, but one that really presses in my head is that the IMF predicts that you need 18 million new jobs every year until 2035 just to absorb this growing population. So when we talk about the danger, if these jobs aren't created, then what are the alternatives? The most recent studies and interviews of people who are recruited to extremist causes cite to economic hopelessness, and they cite to grievances against the government, even more so than ideological appeal in many cases. And so when you have an increasingly connected population without access to jobs, without access to economic growth, that is a true danger in terms of instability. Exactly. And instability is at the crux of the national security of every country around the world. Instability does not respect borders. Instability does not respect geographic boundaries. And so that's something that we need to think. Not There, there is a clear-cut business rationale to be investing, but there's also a need to be a partner to African states that are looking to create these investment climates and looking to grow jobs because it's in everyone's interest. Okay, we're starting to run out of time, so we just have a quick one for each member of the panel again. Going back to holding governments to account, what is the international role in making sure governments are held to account? Yonov? Well, uh, I'm, I come from a rules-based organization which has a very good dispute settlement uh, mechanism. So if a government acts arbitrarily, I mean, the other members already could take the government yeah. to court in terms of how the dispute is settled. However, I think for Africa, the key challenge now is not just how you hold governments to account. It's the recognition that trade and investment are not enough. They need to be supported by other policies. That will make the environment better. Take, for instance, education. The time we grew up learning to read and write, and which gave us jobs, is not the same environment today. People need better skills. So African countries that are reforming their educational sector to enable the youth use their hands and creativity and talent are better off than African countries that continue to produce basic education graduates across the board. If we go that path, there is no way you can hold anybody accountable because the problems will multiply more than whatever commitments that government may have on the sands. Thanks very much. If I just ask the final, the, the key challenge to both Grant and Mary, the key challenge now facing Africa, just one key challenge. I think we need to also, uh, very quickly, we need to think about the grassroots who are putting, who are really getting government accountable. The social media, the, the bloggers of Africa, people tweet on Facebook. Government can't just do things by themselves anymore. And I think we need to bear that in mind too. Mm. The major challenge? What do you see as the one major challenge? I, I, I see opportunities, to be honest with you. I don't see challenges. I see major opportunities in the continent. We have, you know, we need to just create amazing frameworks where people have their say, government are listening, investors are coming into the continent, and people are involved. The, the education system of Africa needs to change. Maybe that's one of the biggest challenges. I didn't go to school. I've never sat on a, in a classroom. But how did I end up being a tech CEO, a global tech CEO today? We need to see alternative education also across the continent and just go because you know we, we've been colonized by France and by Britain we don't have to follow the path of the colon colonialists we need to just create our own path create alternative education and then you know use technology as a way of, of being creative uh, that's what we need to do but if we start following the the, the current path and and find out what's gonna happen we're not gonna find us out we you're not gonna find Mariam Jams uh, around the world in the next 10 20 years if we carry on following the path we are currently okay so education again grant the I one major challenge that you see? Education is definitely important. I think uneven governance is the biggest challenge. And you've got some strong reformers, but you've also got some horrible heads of state 
that are really not respecting civic space or human rights or really trying to create the type of investment climate that will be needed. And governments will not have enough money for public sector spending to solve infrastructure deficits or to create these types of jobs. It's got to be understood that capital is cowardly and it will go to the best place around the globe. And I want to have African states be even more attractive in getting that capital and creating the jobs and the opportunity that are deserved. Right. Thank you very much. A really interesting discussion. Thank you to the panelists, to Yonov, to Grant, and to Mariam. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.